Hello, my name is Andy McCarran, and this is the SBC Leaders Podcast, where we speak to some of the leading minds uh, in the gambling industry. And with me today, we have Sam Brown, who's the CEO of Roots.com, who just happens to be one of the uh, newest members of the SBC Leaders Collective. Sam, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's uh, good to have you on board. Thanks for your time. So let's go, go jump straight into it. 2023 saw you take the role of CEO at Roots, sort of taking over from the co-founder, Lassa Rantala. How challenging is it to take over a business from a, from a founder? Because he was one of the co-founders. You know, how, how do your styles differ? Um, how difficult is it? I, I guess I'm still, uh, still finding out. It's been, uh, it's been only, uh, three or four months. And, uh, so far I've got very used to signing a lot of things. So that's been my, my first, uh, my first initial reaction, but, uh, no taking over. I mean, the great thing is this Lasso is still part of the business. So he, he chairs the board. He's, uh, and, you know, he's in the office with us most days and, and he's, uh, you know, I still have that uh, that safety net of, of having him there. And he is the kind of, you know, the fountain of, of all knowledge, having been there right from the, the foundations upwards. So um, I haven't felt too lonely yet, which is uh, which is good. It can often be a, a little lonely. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's always going to be difficult when you take over from a founder if you have sort of fundamentally different principles but i but i don't believe that we do uh lasso and i we we have a kind of similar a similar mentality to how we run the business which is we we like to you know we we like we, we have a good appetite for risk um and and we like to uh let people do what they do and, and, and not put too much kind of micromanagement uh, pressure uh, on, on people. And so that's around that business in, in, in this way where we have a very, a very sort of flat, organic culture. Anyone can talk to anybody and, and, and that's a really nice part of the business. And that's very much my style also. So I feel that we, um, we, we kind of, you know, the, the the transition was never going to be be too difficult. Of course, there are nuanced, very nuanced things that we we do very differently. But as a rule, you know, we we don't we don't manage the business too far into the future. We have a okay. you know we have a mission and a, and a vision, but we we also understand that we're in a volatile business. Not everything is under our control, especially as we venture into more regulated spaces. Um, so we, we have a kind of roll with the punches approach to, to business, I would say, and, and uh, try and yeah try and make the most of the, the opportunities that present themselves. So in that sense, we're not uh, we're not a company that uh, you know has rigid forecasts and budgets and 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 tries to tightly tightly manage the the, the top line. We're we're all about getting that bottom line growth and and uh, we have a pretty flexible approach to getting there so we we lasso and i definitely share that in terms of approach yeah it's more of a case of um yeah seeing what comes and being flexible and adaptive and you know, quick responding mm-hmm. i guess to um yeah to the opportunities what which might which might um uh present themselves <clears throat> and like you say it does change it can change quite quickly in, in this in this market um i suppose that's where some of the push for uh, entering and, and operating in the regulated markets is perhaps a bit better for your, <laughs> for your blood pressure in, in that um, you've got a bit more certainty there in the regulated markets. Um, I mean, in the past year, you've seen new licenses in Ontario and Germany, I believe. I mean, those are two right. very different markets when it comes to regulations. How, how do you approach them? Um, they are indeed very, very different. So the the main challenge I would say that we have um, in Ontario is just, uh, you know, good old fashioned competition. Uh, there's some massive North American players who, 
who only focus Ontario when it comes to their Canadian business because it's the only uh, lo- only locally regulated province thus far. So in that market, it's very stiff competition. We try to stay out of the silly stuff um, with, uh, you know, when it comes to paying $2,000 CPAs and various things for our traffic. So we, we try to, we try to box smart in those markets, try and get a good blend of a good appetite for trying new things and taking risks, but also making sure that we don't go, um, we don't go negative on our, on our kind of ROI projections. But in those markets nowadays, I think you have to be, you know, where previously we might have looked at three and six month payback on, on CPAs. I think in these markets these days, you can go out as far as two years when you're looking at ROI because it's about the only way that you can be in any way competitive. And, and of course, if you push yourself up into those uh, MGM style CPAs, then uh, yeah, that, that, that pushes us uh, into a level where a, a fight that we don't really want to be in. So it's a grind in that market, to be honest. We would like to have like to have seen some faster growth uh, out of the gate, but now I think we've settled into a, a pretty healthy growth rate. We've been been double digits um, month on month for the last three months, so we're starting to make our way back um, in that market. By contrast, um, Germany is. Uh, it is again fierce competition, but but from the black market. So it's it's uh, you know we the reg, acting in the within the regulated space. The, the level the the playing field's not fair <laughs> between the regulated and non regulated. I mean we have ten percent of the games. We have one euro stake li- um, stake limits. We have to have. Uh, much lower RTPs to cover the uh, the turnover tax regime, and uh, you know, and, and and again, all these res- restrictive factors that you know would essentially create a worse product for the consumer. And when the when the when the white market can not be competitive, then uh, you you have a you have a problem, and and that's unfortunately where we are. At the moment, although they are the German regulators are good regulators, they they uh, um, they engage conversation. Um, they're of course very early in it. No one was expecting them to come out with a perfect piece of regulation to start with. But I think now the important process, you know, it's important. We see the long term value in in Germany, and we want to work with uh, with the regulator to create a. An environment which is both safe and and competitive um, to to make sure more and more of that market gets channelized. But again, it's a it's a tough market just for very different reasons than than Ontario. But uh, yeah, two two uh, two tough markets, but two markets that we see the long term future in, and we feel that we we're up to the fight in those markets. I find it quite encouraging that the you, you say the regulators are receptive to discussion in Germany because you um, in certain places you know you, you've, you've also spoken about the dangers of gambling regulations being too restrictive and then opening the door to the black market. How much do the, does the industry need to educate the lawmakers as well as the regulators more about this? And you know, obviously in Germany they they seem quite receptive. Is 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 that um, do you find that in other markets as well, or is or is it more of a a closed door to the industry and they'll get on with um, whatever they want to do? Well, it again massively varies. If we look, uh, you know, domestically where I am here today in Malta, and we talk about the Malta Gaming Authority, um, extremely receptive. You know, very. Uh, you know, very open channels, really good, solid understanding of, of the industry and what it takes to operate in the industry and what it takes to operate um, in a safe and sensible way in, in the industry. And, and so um, 
really good example there. I think the same in, in the UK. Uh, I have not been privy to the, the latest reforms in the UK. I've not been, uh, I've not operated in that market for, for many years, but certainly from, you know, the biggest indication that, that it works is that the fact that there's a not, not negligible, but extremely small black market available in, in the UK. And, and because the gambling companies can, can be competitive and can advertise and can, you know, uh, you know, albeit in, in a controlled manner with watersheds and, you know, non use of, of childhood, you know, child facing types of messaging and imagery. So good regulation, I would say, in, in the UK. Then around Scandinavia, I think, you know, the Swedish, uh, Swedish license was probably an example where a, a lot of non-gaming people created a piece of, of regulation and, and, uh, was, was not, uh, was not well thought out, um, but have then since made, made changes and, and, uh, and move things, uh, move things forward. But to answer your question, I think generally speaking, it astonishes me to this day that operators are not, um, they don't seek enough, that regulators don't seek uh, more time with operators during these processes to, to, um, to ensure that, that you, you can, as I say, maintain this balance of, of being competitive and, and safe at the same time. Um, it, it's, and it also astonishes me that every time a new market regulates, they decide to completely rewrite the rules and, and not pay <laughs> yeah, attention to <laughs> any of the success, <laughs> any of the success stories out there on the market. Again, uh, astonishing to me to, that, that people would, would feel that their wildly different regulation was somehow going to solve the smallest uh, defect in a very successful other piece of regulation. So yeah, it, it's uh, it's weird. It's like uh, yeah, having a design for an almost perfect car and then deciding to release a, a six wheel version of it because that's feels like it will be more safe. It's uh, yeah, it's it's a bit odd. I like that analogy. I mean, you've just mentioned sort of Malta being a, you know, a very progressive uh, iGaming space. <clears throat> As a result of that, perhaps, and and obviously the geography there, um, it's also a very competitive market when it comes to talent within the industry. Um, how are you making Roots an, an attractive destination for gaming professionals when it comes to sort of your recruitment and your growth? Uh, good question. I mean, we, we are, it, Roots is, uh, you know, is still a privately held company. Um, and, uh, not too much is, is known about us, uh, beyond the rock of, of Malta. But within Malta, we, we are, um, we are quite well known and well respected, I think, um, for a combination of, being founded by people that had roots elsewhere in, in the industry. So we're already known. And, and then uh, ultimately by the, you know, by the quality of the product. So when, when roots uh, first casino wilds was launched, it, you know, it raised significant eyebrows and drew, drew applause from, from the industry. And, and the fact that, uh, that sends a really good message to anybody, I think, out there in, in, uh, in the gaming space. Like, you know, the people will always want to come and work for companies that can design and build excellent products. So I think that the product speaks, speaks volumes about what makes us attractive as a business. Um, and then we have, you know, this kind of quite, focused on, on culture, so on the type of people that we bring into the organization and making sure that those people fit. And, and as I said, it can be, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not, we're not the most disciplined uh, company in the world. We, there's an element of chaos to everything we do. Um, and we really love that about our business. And, and we like to be 
uh, we like to be, we like to be different. We like to be brave and, and agile. And, and sometimes that can also be perceived as a little wild and erratic. And so you have to be, you know, you have to be of the right frame of mind to be comfortable working in a, in an environment like that. So I think once we have, once we find those people, um, the more of those people we find, the easier it seems to be to find more of them, if that makes sense. So um, seems to kind of solidify even more with the with the more people we bring into the business. So yeah, uh, probably a combination of that, the, the products themselves, and then a a, a, a reputation of, of working in a with a certain style that attracts people. And also yeah. detracts people, so we're well aware of that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I must admit, I kind of recognise the um, the the description of um, chaotic creativity, shall we say? Because <laughs> uh, that, that's that's kind of one of the founding things of SBC, and before now, it's been very much my style of management. Um, but we've been working hard on getting the. Should we share the guide rails a bit a bit closer in so we can be chaotic and organised at the same time? <laughs> That's it. As, as, as ridiculous as that sounds, um, but no, I, I, I do think creativity and that sort of thing does need that element of chaos, that element of uncertainty, because that's when um, the unexpected arrives and it can really differentiate you. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, mm-hmm. that's interesting. I mean, uh, you've you've had. Um, You've had uh, plenty of experience in around different areas of the, of the industry. I mean, you had one, um, you've had a, a stint or two at a B2B supplier. How does that help you from an operator perspective, having having been on the other side of the fence? Uh, well, my, my specific experience there was running uh, a live casino business, which is, uh, it, I mean, the best... It, it's, it's, I guess, not dissimilar to running a, a regular casino business in terms of all of the, uh, it's very, very operationally focused and very staff focused. And I think one of the key things I learned was, um, you know, how to, how to manage at scale. Uh, previously I'd worked with, I would say, smaller, uh, and more niche teams and and now it was dealing with sort of what had to be because of the nature of it being shift work and so on uh, a quite hierarchical and rigid structure with with a large number of of staff so again just a completely different management experience to to anything i'd i'd had before so at a personal level uh i took a lot of value from that um, at a commercial level, um, you you obviously get a bit of um, a bit of broad exposure on how the internal workings of some of the other operators in the industry. So, which other you know, without working within that business, would be hard to obtain. So you kind of you get a better idea of how the bigger and the smaller and the medium sized companies, how they operate and what's important to them. Yeah, um, what their priorities so, are. Yeah. yeah, exactly what their priorities are and, and where do you fit into those and, you know, almost kind of how, yeah, the, the, the you know, the, the reason I couldn't stay that side of the, of the business is because it moves too slow for my sort of fast chaotic pace. Like I, 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 I I, you know, getting a deal done and then it going live in in nine to twelve months' time is, you know, took all the wind out of my sails almost every time, and 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 so uh, ultimately I was I was craving uh, craving the kind of madness of, of of being on the operator side day to day, where you I mean quite literally have no, you probably know about well. However, you expect your day to go. Probably about thirty percent of it goes that way, and seventy percent of it goes in a completely, completely different tangent in a different direction. And I love that about uh, our industry, and I especially love that about being on the operator side. Yeah, it sounds very much like a newsroom as well. Um, you never know quite know what you're going to get when you go into into uh, 
into the office. I mean, uh, one of the higher profile things you guys have done is um, is bring on um, David Hasselhoff as a, as a brand ambassador uh, for, I think, using it from the Wheels brand. Um, yeah. How how has he been to work with? You know, why why choose the Hoff? You know, and have you been surprised that just basically the extent of his uh, of his um, popularity really? Um, I um, unfortunately have not had the pleasure of working directly with uh, with the Hoff. Is it not a perk um, of the big the big set? Uh, <laughs> no, it's unfortunately not. I, Missed that part in my contract. Unfortunately, it should have been more clearly stipulated. But uh, no, he, he, I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't worked with him. But the guys in the office that did uh, said it was a lot of fun, and and uh, we got some. I mean, really, really fantastic uh, content from him. Uh, even had our own song, our own jingle. Um, so, um, really, you know, really fun to. You know, individual to work with, as you can probably imagine from his from his personality. And in terms of choosing him, I, I mean, yeah, he, we at the time were were positioning those brands towards the uh, Germanic markets, and, and he's just such a, a legend in those in those parts of the world that we were. Uh, I, I don't think surprised at all. I think we were just justified in in. Where he was um, met 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 our expectations, I would say. But yeah, unfortunately, still yet to meet the Hoff in person. But, um, hopefully, bring him along to one of our next events and uh, <laughs> see uh, see the crowds forming around him. It's uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's, a, it's an unusual allure that um, that the Hoff has got, hasn't it? Um, I mean, coming cool. up to you coming up to twenty years in the industry now. Um, and obviously, with a variety of different operators, a uh, variety of different roles, um, what would you say have been the key lessons you've learned around leadership in that time? You know, who's who's managed to inspire you uh, along the way? Oh, really good question. What have I learned along the way? I think uh, you know. You, I think the most fulfilling. You know, roles I've had and the most fulfilling companies I've worked at, the common, like the red thread through those was just high levels of trust. So uh, working for um, owners and investors that you can trust, working with peers that you can trust, with bosses that you can trust, with staff that you can trust. And, you know, my my advice to all leaders, especially when entering a new business is, if the only thing you achieve in the first six months is uh, kind of gaining the trust of those around you, uh, you've had a very successful first six months, and and uh, from there you can make you can make things happen a lot a lot more easily, uh, as opposed to the kind of what I would call a hard landing coming in and and thinking that you know better than everyone and trying to make an immediate impact and prove to the boss that you're, you were the right guy. And, you know, I've, I've, I've learned that sadly from my own poor uh, choices in, in choosing to enter companies in, in that way. Um, but I think as you, as you mature, the, you realize that the, this, especially in leadership roles, as I said, the softer, the softer landing, Mm-hmm. Um, I would say it has been really a really important kind of uh, learning from me. And, and yeah, it is so much because the industry is so much about trust anyway. And, and I think that kind of resonates through to, to the behaviors of, uh, of the leaders. And as I said, when you, when you work in uh, environments with a high level of trust, then you're also working typically in, in businesses with a, a good uh, understanding and appetite for risk taking, uh, which of course to have that appetite requires by default, a high level of trust in the people around you trust that they'll be brave, that they'll brave enough to do the crazy stuff and then trust that they would also learn from, learn from it when they crash and fall and, and kind of get back up in a, 
uh, and, and kind of muck themselves off in a uh, in a nice fashion. So that that I think is been my yeah probably the biggest biggest takeaway and and yeah in terms of the leaders that had inspired me again it was this was you know in their dna they were just inherently highly trustworthy and and uh also able to give um give a lot of trust uh to those to those around them so what what i'm feeling from this conversation is is part of the key way of you do business is getting good talented people and then kind of get out of their way and let them do their do, do their stuff yeah 100%. that's uh <clears throat> i mean with regards to culture um one of the questions we always ask is uh sort of the leaders that come on here is it, what do you do to relax at the end of the day you know or a long long week what, what, what do you do to sort of recharge your batteries kind of away from work to to give you the um to give you impetus to to hit the working day at at 100 percent um well i yeah i mean as i've got older and technology has has got better uh you know we have these health trackers that that tell us a lot of good information and again i think you need to trust that information and learn how to how to use that information um so in more recent years, being able to track the quality of my sleep has definitely helped me understand um, when when I can be at you know a hundred percent and when I can be at one hundred and twenty percent and when I can only be at fifty percent. So I think you have to listen as you get older and, and understand that that really does matter. Um, and then for me, as I a huge believer that this this uh you know massive positive correlation between being physically fit and and being and having the uh, being mentally fit being being able to take on more so a lot of what i do rather than winding down is uh i do a lot of sports outside of uh outside of the office it kind of channels can channel your frustration or it can uh energize you or it can tire you out i think it's a it, you can you can take what you want from from physical exercise so here we're you know play some golf and some paddle and football and gym and some of things I occasionally decide to do stupid things like running half marathons and marathons mm. but less of that as i as i get older but i think the yeah, one of the biggest things I've probably learned in more recent years is the the value of quality sleep. That's certainly really, really helped me uh, be prepared for, for what's coming. Oh, that's interesting because, yeah, a bunch of people I know have got these rings to help monitor the sleep, the sleep patterns to... Um... Mm-hmm. To to en- <clears throat> to enhance um, you know the the physical shape and like you say, know mm-hmm. when to do things and when not to do things. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm limping from playing football this weekend, so I still haven't <laughs> I still haven't quite got that knowledge of when not to do things. <laughs> but um, no, it's a uh, um, yeah, keeping your body active and fit is is a good way of, of keeping your your brain refreshed as well. But um, no. Uh, uh, just, just for the last, last, last question, uh, you talk, you, you said you don't really do a lot of sort of long term planning when it comes to routes, but um, you must have some kind of vision for where you want the company company to be. So maybe say five years this time. Yeah, I mean, we the long term strategy is is to take podium positions in the markets we're in, right? So we really want to win at the markets we're in. We're probably not hugely concerned with any further sort of global expansion. I think rather we, we would we would we would prefer to be be excellent in the markets that we're in and, and the markets that we are in are either already regulated or we see in the next three to five years a path to those revenues becoming regulated and so that is a uh, a core part of our strategy so the vision is to trend to a 
as high a percentage of possible uh, of regulated revenues um, and to leave a lasting impact on the industry around us. Um, but those are, that's about as detailed as we get when we look forward. Well, you've made a good start with that anyway. So, um, <laughs> Sam, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I appreciate it. And, um, yeah, look forward to seeing you at an SBC event soon. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fun.